Anything is possible. New freezer, it's a lot of them. What's happening? Uh, nothing much. Just want to make sure that I get the. Is the background okay? And the. Perfect. Can hear you great. Um, Nick, appreciate you hopping on, man. Thanks for making the time. No problem. Awesome. Well, uh, first off, happy Friday. You know, this is episode 15, everyone. We've got Nick Desai, who is the founder and CEO of Snack It Forward. And, you know, with, with awesome brands, with Pitos being one of their uh, main brands. Um, but Nick, you know, would love to hear a little bit about your background, who you are, and, you know, what, what really brought you in, into CPG. Yeah, uh, well, uh, I started my career, believe it or not, in the entertainment business. Many years ago, I was a, a, a lawyer for the MGM studios. Um, and uh, I learned a lot about storytelling back in, you know, being in the entertainment business. Uh, moved into investment banking after that. Uh, was helping smaller companies, you know, raise capital or do mergers and acquisitions, which again, taught me a lot about uh, you know, how the, these companies are run, what entrepreneurs are like, and how uh, cash is managed. Uh, and then in 2008, when the financial bubble burst, I decided to move from being kind of a middleman helping others, um, you know, buy and sell companies or raise capital to wanting to own my own company. And uh, so I pursued a dream that I had for many years, a vision that, that had been kind of percolating in the back of my mind. And uh, ended up buying uh, a, a small company that was a turnaround. It was a nut and trail mix manufacturer that was in the snack food space. And at that That's time, was it, was it called World Peas or am I crazy? No, it actually all started with called Energy Club. World Peas came a few years later. Okay. So how did, how did you, was it a company that you had identified or you had seen or you gotten, like, how did you end up finding that company and getting excited about it? Yeah, so, so for many, many years, I had this idea, right, of, of like, uh, the, where, where the whole thing stemmed from is like being able to take a multicultural experience and realize that you, you may have some insights that, that maybe everyone else is not privy to. And, and, um, and so my parents are from India originally, and I grew up in the United States. So, but I would travel to India a lot to visit my grandparents. And um, during those travels, I was exposed to the Indian world of snacks. Now here in the US, I was always a big what I call avid, you know, I love salty, crunchy fried stuff, let's just say. Mm -hmm. I was never a big sweet person. I, I didn't ever like dessert. So my dessert was Doritos, you know. Yeah. So I love Cheetos, Doritos, Funyuns. And then when I went to India, I was exposed to this whole world of Indian crunchy fried snacks. But there was a big difference between the two, which, which over time, you know, um, I came to realize and really study. Uh, but what it was is that the, the snacks here were mostly made from a base of corn. Uh, whereas the, the snacks in India were made from a base of peas and lentils. And they were doing it that way over there, not because they were trying to make a healthier snack, but because it was a more you know cheap local crop. But when I was looking at the nutritional profile of the two, I noticed that the snacks in India had significantly higher protein and fiber content per serving. So that's what kind of led to the original insight. And the, and the original idea I had was, you know what, I, I, one day I should bring these Indian snacks to the American market because people would love them because I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of like first generation American. And I love them. So I figured yeah. others would like them. Yeah. Uh, and, and by the way, I saw the same thing happen in a different category, which was wildly successful, which is coconut water. So coconut water I had like, you know, 40 years ago on the beaches in India. And in India, coconut water has been around for a long time, like even in Mexico, just our, our, our country, our neighbor next door. But yeah. here in the U.S., it, it really wasn't around until about you know, 15 years ago when suddenly, you know, uh, it became a billion dollar category in a few years. So, uh, you know, I, that, those are my two big ideas. And I saw the coconut water one happen under my eyes. And I'm like, I can't miss out on the second one. So but the problem was, you know, being, you know, having come from like an, uh, you know, uh, an investment banking background, you know, like I just wasn't everyone has their own strengths and weaknesses, their own personality. And I knew I wasn't going to be the kind of guy who was going to walk into the kitchen and, and cook up a batch of these snacks, you know, and then and start serving them up. And uh, you know, that kind of approach just wouldn't have worked for me. So I'm like, you know, I need I need a platform to start this off of. I need something of scale to build this from like a springboard. And that was where the idea of, of kind of acquiring a, an existing company that was in the snack space came. And then I figured if I can find something that's having a little bit of trouble, acquire it and then kind of retool it, reshape it, that would be a great way to get into it. So I wanted to find something that was overall in the salty snacks category, but not quite doing what I, what I wanted. And I ended up finding this nut and trail mix manufacturer that was local that I figured, oh, this is going to be perfect. I'm here in Southern California. They're here. And, uh, and, and so I acquired it. Um, 
I was fortunate early on to get some really incredible investors to join, uh, including guys like Carlos Barroso, who is a former head of global R&D for Frito-Lay. So what better guy to have on your team? But um, what I underestimated heavily was many things, including how difficult it would be to take this existing company and change direction, how many things are going to go wrong along the way, and by the way, how much money I'm going to need. I grossly underestimated <laughs> all of those things uh, and ended up, I, I literally had like a you know three-year plan where I was like, okay, within 12 months, I'm going to do this, this, and this. I'm going to repurpose this. I'll be, you know, I'll be doing the Indian snacks by like month 18. You know, by year three, my revenue is going to be this. None of it came to pass. Uh, by, by the end of three years, I was almost bankrupt. <laughs> Which is just, just to stop you, Nick, just so you know, yeah. I used to be an investor. I used to work at Hulahan Loki for four and a half years before Oh, this. you did? And oh, wow. I have a very, I mean, I, we didn't acquire a company, but in a very similar way, um, you know, I was working in TMT, but then CPG and got so, you know, fell in love with these incredible business models. I had an internship for a guy named Jesse Itzler. Speaking of coconut water, he was one of the early investors with Mark Rampola and Zico. And when I, Zico, saw, them, okay. when I saw them building Zico and the coconut water wars that were happening in the 2010s, yep. Fell in love with the business. He started launching other better for you CPG brands, um, and and then scaling them through, on the marketing side through social media, and then you know just really felt, saw the opportunity as well. So it's awesome. I, I, I do you do you know a guy named John Mavradakis? Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, of course. so John John's a friend of mine too, and and, and a couple of the who ex Hulan guys are investors in the company. There you go. There, there you go. I think there's so much I want to cover because your approach is so unique, but also like, I, I love your brand. I love your concept. I also am just a massive fan of how you're calling out the, the stark and just the true, the true realities of CPG. I mean, you made one comment about Amazon versus Frito-Lay and I like, we, we can go into that in a bit, but just to start on, on your acquisition, and here's my question. So you were at Focal Point, and then you were also uh -huh. at a private equity. Was it Shackleton Private Equity? Yes, Were you exactly. doing transitions and CP, or transactions in CPG prior, or was it something that you were just you got uh, like a little bit of experience with? Um, no, I had done some C, uh, C, CPG transactions during the banking days, but um, it was more nothing in the food arena. It was more like furniture products and things like that. Um, you know, I, I had worked with a variety of different companies, some service companies, some product companies, nothing specifically in the consumer food space. But, you know, I mean, look, at the end of the day, I think that business, you, you know, people, people tend to have like a knack for business. I think that sometimes you're, you're, it's, it's ingrained in you. My dad was an entrepreneur. My grandfather was an entrepreneur. And I always say the business of, of doing something is very different than the, than the trade of doing it. So it's a quick example because I started my career as a lawyer. Like being a great lawyer is very different from running a great law firm. And in fact, most great lawyers do not know the first thing about running the business no of, of law. You know, so being a great doctor is totally different from running a business of medicine. And most great doctors have no clue about how to run the business of medicine. So how about being a great has, managing yeah. director at an investment bank? It's the same concept, right? I mean, exactly. the best managing directors, frankly, are the best producers and business development guys, exactly. as opposed to the most technically sound real bankers. I mean, exactly. Exactly. And that, and it's funny you say that because that was what, like, I got into investment banking even in a funny way because I came from the entertainment business. And the skill that I had was, 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 was cultivating new clients. You know, I wasn't even like, I, I, I did, when I first got hired, I, my first job in investment banking was with KPMG and I got hired as a vice president. I like literally I jumped up to vice president level. I hadn't ever opened a spreadsheet at that point, believe it or not. You know, it, it sounds crazy, but, but I, but I brought in more people that first year. I was the biggest producer in the firm nationally. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so, I mean, you know how crazy. it works. It's crazy. So, yeah. so um, just uh, one of the people in the comments, Newsy, uh, the company is called Snack It Forward. Nick's company is Snack It Forward uh, and Pitos is, is the, yes. the brand. Do you guys have any other brands under the umbrella yet or is it just Pitos right now? When we, st when we started out, we, we, had the, we started out with the nut and trail mix business. And what we did is we had acquired a long-term license to the Sunkiss brand. And so right. we were marketing the, 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 the nut and trail mix and fruit-based products under the Sunkiss brand. Our two big product lines were a trail mix type product, like a premium trail mix, and then also freeze-dried fruit product. And those were the two big things. We sold the Sunkiss business in 2018, and now we're just focused on pedos. What I found is that it, while it seems, sometimes it seems like there's synergy in owning multiple things. What you, what you also find is that when you're doing something early on, especially, and you know this better than anyone, you have to be obsessively focused on it because 
it is going to suck up. And people always say like, oh, Nick, are you doing this full time now? I'm like, yeah, I wish I was just doing it full time. You know? <laughs> like, like I'm doing it night, day, morning, breakfast, lunch, dinner, you know, shower, bathroom, you know? <laughs> I, it's so true. I, you know, when, I, when people say to me, and I'm sure they do this all the time, hey, I'm looking to start this, you know, food and beverage brand on the side. I'm like, then you're not yeah. really trying to start a, a CPG brand. Because exactly. It's, I mean, we were, you were in banking. I was in, like, it's, it's more intense um, in terms of the time required, the amount of variables, um, and like you said, capital required to scale. So let's go back to early days of Snack It Forward. You know, when you raised that initial capital, did you buy a factory? Did you just buy a brand with co -pack, like a co-packing uh, foundation? What, what exactly did you buy into? And what did you start to develop? No, this was like a full thriving, like it was. Sorry, Nick, I think, uh, I think you might have froze. One second. Nick, can you hear me? Got it. It had been around for 19 years by the time you bought it? Mm -hmm. Yep. Awesome, awesome. And so it was, you know, it was generating like, you know, was it a profitable business? Was it distressed? You know, no, that was the thing. It was not profitable. That's why we acquired it. It was basically the market dynamics had shifted. The underlying uh, commodity prices had, had basically skyrocketed. And these, these guys had no pricing power because they didn't have a brand, you know, a, a really recognizable brand. And I was, I always tell people having your own name on a product is not the same as having a brand, you know? Um, and so uh, these guys had the former, but not the latter, and they were losing money. And that, that's when we stepped in. Got it, got it. So you, you acquired the company with the long-term thesis and goal of really reimagining sna salty snacks with pea-based products. Exactly. Um, uh, I guess you mentioned you cut, like it, you thought, all right, 18 months, we're going to have this amazing brand hit the market. What were some of like the biggest hurdles uh, to that initial approach? Well, the, the first hurdle was just like uh, underestimating how difficult it is to take an existing company and, and repurpose it. You know, like, like I, I came in day one thinking, oh my God, I have this amazing vision. I'm just going to tell everyone what we're going to do and they're going to be jumping up and down and totally get it. And I came in and my own team was the first one to be like, are, are you freaking crazy? <laughs> you know, and by the way, like we had day to day problems that they were dealing with day in, day out. And everything's like every day I walk into the to the uh, office and something we breaking down in the plant. I'll never forget about Neary and I, I into the into this. I came into the plant one day and these guys from the you know from the from the from the shop floor came run, running up to my office and they're like Nick, we have moths, you know, like like those little fly, you know, the little insects, right? Oh my god! And I'm like <laughs> I'm like moth. I'm like, well, big deal. Like kill it. You know, like you're telling me about a moth. Like and they're like no 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 come come with us and they like grab me run downstairs. We had just, we had to deliver this thing to a, a Kroger, a ma your major customer. And we had gotten in like a $600,000 worth of almonds, this big shipment of almonds. And every single, yeah. I look, they showed me the almonds. And I'm like, oh, they look like they look great. What's wrong? And they're like, no, look closer. I look closer. And is they're moving, you know? And, oh, and it turns out that the whole God. shipment is full of these little weaver moths that like eat nuts. And it's basically the whole thing's infested. And they're like, not only is this infested, but it may get into the warehouse. We have to shut oh the whole thing down. The whole thing. I mean, this is like, I am like, oh my God, I might be out of business tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. how, how quickly did, or how soon after your acquisition did this happen? This was about near into it. Oh my God. That is, that is a nightmare. So, okay, so you fumigated it. How do, how do you handle that situation? Just very curious. You fumigate the whole facility. <laughs> What what do you do? You tell Kroger. We we, we we had we had to take the shipment, quarantine it, return it to the you know to the uh, by uh, vendor. They sent a new shipment. We we did a we did a quick fumigation internally. I mean, it's it's a common, it's not an uncommon thing. Call it in the nut industry. Yeah. But for me, who come out of the, you know come with zero experience, and this is kind of where like where they always say with entrepreneurs, some level of naivete is actually a good thing. Because honestly, if I had known what I was getting into, if I had known the, the hurdles I would have, if I had known that those first three years, I would almost end up like killing, not killing myself, like wanting to, ki you know, like kill myself, Dude, meaning no dying question. from the agony and anxiety <laughs> of like doing this thing, you know? And, and if I had known all that, I may not have done it, you know? <laughs> but I'm, I'm the same exact way. But I mean, it, it's so true. And you only can say that once you've kind of been through some of the darkest moments. But exactly, look, man. All right. So. Okay, so you've you've managed to you sell you sold off that sort of the, that part of the business in 2018. But let's talk about getting the new because was there a new technology associated with creating these new chips? Because you were doing nuts and trail mix. So how do you move yeah. over to doing uh, salty snacks? 
Yeah. So, 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 like, so basically what happened is again, early on, I found out that, you know what, step one is I got to fix this business because if I don't fix what we have now, we won't even make it and no one's going to put any faith in me, you know? Right. And I realized right. I needed a lot more money, a lot more. So basically those first 40 years I spent fixing that business. And what happened is about two and a half years into it, I had an epiphany and the big epiphany was, you know what, I don't want to be in the manufacturing business anymore. Uh, I need to be in the brand ownership business, the brand development business. And those are two different businesses. Like if you think about even a business the size of Apple, as massive as they are, Apple is not in the manufacturing business. They're in the product development and, and brand development business, right? And so I was like, I think you kind of got to in this day and age choose one or the other. And so I said, I want to choose the brand development side because while it's riskier, there's a lot more upside there. and You can get higher ROI. So I basically shut down the plant. I sold it all, I sold off all the equipment. I paid off all our debt. I went to a co-packing uh, methodology and that changed the whole equation. So within, within about nine months of doing that, and by the way, this was no small feat. I mean, it was one of those things where I thought we're either going to come out of this alive or dead, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, but it had to be done. Something, something big had to give. And so I took my seven best employees out of 70, which completely changed. We went to these Regis temporary offices and completely changed the way the business was operating. And that was really the turning point. So nine months after that it occurred, we landed Walmart as a client. So suddenly our revenues are up and our costs are down dramatically. And that was a secret combination to, to generate and the, profit. and the unit economics made sense right off the bat with the co-packing. Oh, relationship. it was so funny. We actually had higher margins co-packing than we were making it on our own. That was always crazy because awesome. these other guys could buy in bigger scale than we could. And they could make it a lot more efficiently than we could. Because, you know, they, they just, that was what they were doing well, you know? And that was a big eye opener for me too, you know? And by the way, the cash flow dynamics were just incredibly better, you know? Like, you're not carrying all this inventory, you're not carrying all this AR. I mean, it was night and day. It's crazy. I will say, we on our end, we don't own the factory, but we own the equipment on the line because it's a, like, our product is a proprietary manufacturing component. So Absolutely. I've been knee deep in understanding the complexities. I mean, we're a manufacturer, like, we are. And yep. I'm learning that world. And wow, Nick, I, I, I just say, I'm sure I, I, I can empathize and I'm in it. And uh, it is really challenging to manage. You're looking at accounts receivable, you're making sure you have enough raw materials exactly. to, to run your line, you're paying, you know, that tolling fee, you're dealing with any issues at the factory. So look, I think there are great key nuggets. I guess my question to you would be, Based on your experience, do you think being vertically integrated has its pros and its cons? Are there ways where the model makes sense versus it doesn't? Like, what, what's your biggest takeaway now? My biggest takeaway is there's no one size fits all. I mean, it really depends on what you're doing, how big you are, what, what are the options out there for Coman? Because based, if you're doing something really unique, then, then there may not be an existing operation that can handle what you're doing. But like that's, you said, there's that's, what, that's, that's what happened with, 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 exactly. there aren't a lot of people. I mean, we couldn't find any co-packers that could do what we needed. Um, exactly. But it sounds like with you guys, you, the entire time, you know, you're manufacturing a different kind of a product. So you, there were co-packers that could do this. Yeah. When we first started, remember that when, when I say manufacturing, this was like, uh, basically what I call re rebagging. Basically, you're getting, you know, nuts. Like, think of like a trail mix. Right? All a trail mix is, is a mixture of five items. So you're getting these items in like 1,000 pound bags and you're just mixing them into smaller batches and packing them. So it's really a packing operation and packing for the most part is a commodity. It's not a, a very highly, you know, um, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, innovative manufacturing operation. So right. it, again, it depends on what you're doing, how unique it is, what the options are externally for having that item co-packed and also what size you are. I think early on, personally, I would avoid at all costs self-manufacturing if you can. Now there's, again, there's no 100% you can always avoid it in anything yeah. you do, yeah. but I would avoid it till you get to about, you know, 10, 20 million in sales. You know, then you start thinking about, I think, equipment ownership and other things. And then once you cross 25, 50, now uh, the opposite becomes true and, and, some, and owning your own manufacturing may make a lot more sense. Totally, totally. Okay, so amazing. You, you, you really were in this really challenging scenario, these, these dark moments where you're self-manufacturing, you tweet, you sell, you sell off the assets, you make this huge pivot, find a co-packer. Walmart sounds like it was a game changer for you. Did you initially roll out into like 200 stores or was it all 2000 or how did that work? Yeah, I went to Vegas with a, with a, with a, with a, with a couple of friends. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm like, you know, we were going to have a great time. Uh, I had been, I had been personally like 
pinging and I'm, 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 I'm like, I like, I'm a, I'm a, what you call an elephant hunter. You know, like I like to go off like every, you know, some people, you know, so there's different mentalities, right? Oh, let's start small and then work our way up. My mentality is let's get the big cat and then go down, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I'm like, I, I wanted to land Walmart more than anything in the world. So I personally tried to cultivate a relationship with the buyer. I would follow up with them every two weeks, right? There's just a regular thing. Sure enough, one Wednesday, this Wednesday, I followed up with them and Thursday we left for Vegas. That evening, uh, I get an email late at night, 9 p.m., right? Uh, I mean, we're out with my friends and everything. And it's like, hey, Nick, can you talk tomorrow morning, 6 a.m.? <laughs> <Right? laughs> right? I'm like, guys, I'm going home. No, th 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 you know, this is like, this, this was big, right? This is it. I, I went home, go to sleep. Uh, I mean, home meaning I, I, I went to the hotel, went to the hotel. Yeah. go to sleep. Yeah, go to sleep. Next morning, I got on this call with this guy. Now, all my, my goal was to get him to do a test with our products. I had already sent him the samples and everything. So he, say, he, he, he says to me, hey, Nick, you know, I, I like what you guys are doing. I give him the pitch. He's like, okay, fine, let's do it. And I'm like, amazing. I'm like, so can we start with like, you know, a hundred store test or something, you know? And he's like, and what he said next, like I literally fell off my chair. He's like, yeah, let's start with 1200 stores. So, <laughs> so oh we, started, we started with shipping shippers to 1200 stores. And that led to being soon within a few months being in all 3200 3, 3, super centers nationwide. So we had, wow. and not only, by the way, it wasn't just, but, and that wasn't the crazy thing. It wasn't just 1,200 stores. It was all nine items. We had nine SKUs. So they literally took the entire line. And it was, it was a game changing moment, obviously. Most people don't realize there's those little, those moments, those breakthrough moments that can define a business or, or kill them. And so exactly. um, that's incredible. So were you guys before Walmart, were you in like, natural or specialty retailers where you what where were you you mentioned kroger where were you selling pedos before that uh before before that no 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 it's not stop pedos remember this is sunkist oh this, this oh this is just this is still yeah this is still in the not in oh, trail okay, okay okay so, cool. so before that we were selling in like if you, if you if you think of gas stations that was our biggest customer so usually they're serviced through like what's called dsd operations yeah, yeah, and yeah. so you got these, you got these literally these guys who are driving around these routes and they may service 50 gas stations 100 gas stations and we had hundreds of these what they call distributors that were our customers and they would go take it into the gas stations and you know that little rack in the gas station where you see like gummy yeah, bears yeah, exactly. like, so you were yeah. selling those pre-packaged we were selling those items sun kiss branded uh, exactly products. cool energy awesome. club and sun kiss branded we had another brand too called energy club awesome awesome and is that that was distributed through just a number of of like uh, DSDs or yeah, we uh, had like two hundred different two hundred DSD customers that would oh. buy in, and they would sell to thousands of these gas stations. Awesome, so, awesome. And then, in, and then, once this Walmart thing went live, we became that year we became profitable because by now we got rid of the plant. We had, we and our revenue shot above ten million, and that was the point when I said, okay, we're finally ready to uh, to get on the second phase of the dream, which was the 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 the, the, the P and legume based snacks. So I started to think about how am I going to do that? Like, what am I going to do? Just, you know, create this product and launch it. Am I going to import these snacks from India? What am I going to do? Right. And even there, we went through so many twists and turns. So the first thing that happened is I came across this company called World Peas. And that was a company started by another South Asian entrepreneur uh, who is now running uh, 4505, the pork rind company. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, and he, he had started this company in Texas, in Austin, Texas. And it was called World Peas. And he had two product lines, a roasted salted fava bean and a wasabi style pea. He was out there raising capital. And I said, look, you know, look, instead of doing this, you know, this is a niche, niche offering, you know, and, and the capital markets are getting tougher. Why don't you merge with us? And, and we'll give you a piece of the mothership. And we have some ideas on how to take this in a different direction. So he, so he merged the company with ours. And that was the beginning of it. And I'm a big believer and you need like a springboard. You need Someone, something to get like the team even excited about, oh my God. So now that I bought this company, the team had no choice, but to, because, I, because before that, when I bring up the idea, even my own team would be like, oh, Nick, we're so busy right now. We don't have time for like, you know, doing no, that. No, I mean, you just closed no. 1,200 Walmarts. I mean, exactly. You know, like the, the sheer volume of making that supply chain challenge alone is its own business. So. Exactly. So, so, right. so they, so, so we bought this company. So now we're like in the business, right? We have to, we have to do something with it. Right. And so we start, we start building that side of the business up and I'm thinking about how do what, I, expand. what year is this by the way? You started in 2011 is when this journey started. Yes. Okay. Yes. Cool. 2016 cool. is where I am now. Cool. Awesome. So 2016 is when I, we bought the world peace company and then we start working on this uh, concept. And the initial concept again was to take these items, use the Indian style snacks and market them. Right. 
Now I'm having conversation one day with Carlos. Remember the Carlos Burroughs? So he's yeah, a former head of the army. And suddenly, like my mind starts spinning. So I'm thinking to myself, you know, and the more research I do, the more I'm le- I'm I'm learning about the snack category and how really there's like one player in the snack category, right? Uh, I mean, like if, if you look at a brand like Cheetos, Cheetos has 92% brand awareness in the U.S., 48% household penetration, $1.7 billion. Literally, in the last second, 92,000 Cheetos were eaten in the United States. So That's so, insane. Wait, and then yeah. you said Frito-Lay owns 65% of the salty U.S. salty snack market? U.S. salty snacks. That's all salty snacks, by the way. When you look at a brand like Cheetos, like, do you even know? Like, if I asked you, you know, who who is the number two guy who does salty snacks, David? Would you even know? Uh, I have no idea. Who is it? I mean, sorry, who is the number two guy who does like a cheese puff? Um, honestly, off the top of my head, like all I can think about is Pirate's Booty, but it's nowhere near as big. So I have no clue. Who 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 is it? What's the answer? Yeah, if you like, if you think about like an orange cheesy looking puff, there's a company called White Snacks, and White Snacks is based on the East Coast. Mm-hmm. The the sales of of cheese is called Cheese Doodles is the brand. Cheese the sales of cheese. Yeah, the sales of cheese doodles in the United States is about $60, $70 million. To Cheetos, $1.7 billion. It's not, it's not even around here. <laughs> so you know? I, how, how did Frito-Lay create such a massive uh, monopoly, effectively, on the business? How did that happen? I, I think, you know, look, it, it's a function of, of, of two things. I mean, they were aggressive with, uh, with accumulating some really strong brands early on. I think they do a fantastic job. I mean, executing. I mean, have you ever opened a bag of Cheetos and it doesn't taste good? You know, it's always fresh. It's always crunchy. Always. It's always it's always perfect. I mean, and all of that's their snacks. I mean, Doritos. You can't argue that they do an amazing job. They own their own manufacturing across the country. They're fully vertically integrated. But they have one other secret sauce. I think that makes them really special and gives them an advantage that no one else has. And that's their DSD system. They have their own in-house DSD system. So. They have, they're the only ones in the business that they're, that, that the drivers that walk in and deliver those snacks to each of these individual stores. Like if you think of your local Kroger, or your local Safeway, their guys are walking into these stores and stocking the shelves. It's not the stores guys. So think of what advantage that gives you, right? You can make sure you're never out of stock. You can make sure that, that no one else is taking your shelf space. And in fact, you're probably taking other people's. Like, so the merchandisers are the yes. DSD trucks. Absolutely. There so they go. control, That's crazy. That's they control really crazy. the delivery of the product to the store and the merchandising of the product on the shelf, both. Which, which, so what, you know, Coca, it's Coca Cola. I mean, right? Exactly. Coca Cola. No, I mean, I mean, PepsiCo owns Frito Lay, remember? Right. So, yeah. yeah. The, yeah, so, so, so exactly. It, it, and the DSD system started with the beverage world, as you know. So it's exactly right. By the way, in ice cream, I think the DSD is pretty big, too, um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a delivery mechanism. Yeah, Nestle and Unilever. Uh, but, exactly. Uh-huh. Um, wow, so interesting. Okay, so sorry. Uh, I know I, like, got off track there. So you're, look, you, you're talking to this guy from Frito-Lay in 2016. Yes, yeah, so we're talking to Carlos, and basically I'm like, Carlos, like, 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 how do you get to, you know, I see so many of these little snack brands and they have small offerings and they have a very hard time even crossing the 10 million mark, you know, even though they have a great idea, right? It's, it's what I call a niche offering. And then I'm looking at these billion dollar brands that, that Frito-Lay has built. And I'm like, Carlos, like, bridge the gap for me. Like, how do you, if you even wanted to dream of being in that realm, like, let's say one day I want to have a billion dollar brand, right? Yeah. Let's say, like, I'm yeah. not saying it can be done. It's very difficult. But I, let's say that's the dream, the vision. How would you get there, you know? And during that conversation, I, I, can't, I can't really give you the full conversation for confidentiality reasons. But during that conversation, what came out of it was, look, instead of this notion of bringing these foreign snacks to the U.S. that people are going to find different and don't really understand and know and appreciate, right? It's a slightly different texture, a different look and feel, different flavor profiles. Why not take America's favorite snacks and basically give them a little twist? Why not bring them to the 21st century, I like to call it? Because it turns out the Cheetos were created in 1948, and they haven't changed much since then. How many products Crazy. do you know that were created in 1948 that are still relevant today? Right? That, you, that's by the you, way. You'd be surprised. Most of the, here's, that's why we got in the business. Same thesis. Yeah. Why, why educate a customer on a new product or, or consumption habit when you can just look at what we've been conditioned to love over the last 50 years, make it better, cleaner, and more relevant with great marketing? Exactly. That's what, got, that's what we do. That's what you guys do. I mean, it, anyway, keep going. No, and that's what that's what that's what many people. That's what the, the the traditional CPG model does, pretty much, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but but I think the entrepreneurs and innovators are, are are now shaking that up a little bit. 
And, but I think, ironically enough, in the food, like you saw, you've seen it happen in technology in a lot of other areas, like or earlier, but in food, like it still stayed pretty old school in, in many ways, you know? And only now are we starting to see, I think, a lot more disruption even in food. But I think food was one of the later ones to kind of give. And I think part of that might be also the, the, the food has always been late to the e-commerce game also, right? And, and, mean, controlling, yeah. and controlling the distribution is one of the ways the CPG guys have really controlled the market. Because even if you had like an amazing idea, let's say, how do you get it on the shelf? Because if you can't get it on the shelf, you're not going to succeed, right? Capital and, and distribution. Right. But, but, but the, even, look, even if you can access capital, I think ca in some ways capital is even easier to access than distribution. Distribution is where all of these guys have, you know, they're all the buddy system, right? It's like, well, you know, the guy, you know, the Frito-Lays, you know, CEO is having, you know, drinks with, with uh, you know, Kroger CEO, you know, who's having drinks with Walmart CEO. Like, it, it's, it's a little bit of that. Now, it's changing now a lot. But in the old days, I mean, they had a virtual lock on really who's, you know, the, the way you get hand groceries in people's hands. But now that's all being changed because the internet has really democratized things and it did it with technology first. It did it with marketing. And now I think we're starting to see it in the food space, especially and, and by if the you way. Build, if you build enough of a cult following, that's where, that's what, when I was working for Jesse with Zico, when you build brands through modern day technology, through the social media channels, et cetera, you're right. You now have this democratized system that's like, wow, people want that. We need to put that in our store or else we're exactly. going to miss, miss out. And by the way, the pandemic has really accelerated that. It's actually helped a ton. You know, like yeah. our sales, our e-commerce sales have mushroomed from 8% of sales to 35% of sales, you know, in the last four months, by the way. <laughs> Crazy. It's Massive. Awesome. Yeah. What, what about the argument that selling salty snacks D to C is really tough to do profitably? Is that true or? It is 100% true. But the, but, the thing, but the fact of the matter is you, you have to look at it as like what I call an omni-channel play. Meaning if you're relying on just one uh, avenue, like the, the, the direct to consumer model or just the retail model or just the food service model, it's not going to be as effective. And if you look at Frito-Lay success, it's one of the other things. They are the only ones that are everywhere. Go to a hotel lobby. What are you going to see? You're going to see Cheetos. Go to a, ca a, a hospital cafeteria. You'll see Cheetos. Go to a convention center. You'll see Cheetos, right? Go to an airline. You're everywhere. They're everywhere. And that's, part of what you have to be in, in, in snacking. So I, we look at D to C as one element of what it takes to succeed, but it has to be closely interrelated with retail and with food service, because that is one of the benefits of, of, uh, of food is that, you know, if, if I buy, you know, a, a television, how many times in a year am I going to buy that TV? You know, probably not even once, maybe once every two years or three years. If I buy a pair of shoes, how many times in a year am I going to buy a pair of shoes? But if I buy a bag of pedos, how many times in a year will I buy a bag of pedos? And by the way, from how many different places will I buy that? Because if I bought that bag of pedos online first, and then I went traveling, I see it on, in, in my hotel room, guess what? I've already tried it. I like it. I'll buy it there. Then I walk in, walking through Costco. Now I see it there. I buy it there. So you really get a lot of that cross-channel you know, That's the beauty of consumer packaged goods and food and beverage is your brand can ex – exactly. When you look at like D2C, you look at – caster mattresses, Warby Parker sunglasses. Exactly. You're only going to make so many purchases every year. But exactly. food and beverage is a brand that stays with you everywhere, which what, I guess, and this is what I would assume, and you probably agree, is why big strategics are paying revenue multiples on these businesses. Because if you find this like product that is relevant to America um, and people want to buy it in all channels, then it's a really valuable asset. Exactly. Exactly right. right. So, so, so that's, that's when the idea morphed to this whole concept of taking America's favorite snacks and just making them better. And that's when we said to ourselves, look, we, we, that was when the insight came up that, hey, if you look at Cheetos or snacks like it, they all have a very basic formula, which is two thirds corn, uh, 30, you know, 25% oil and about 10% seasoning. That is a basic formula for Doritos, for Cheetos, for Funyuns, for everything. A Fritos, I mean, believe it or not, it's just slightly different processes slightly different seasonings, you know, slightly different input ingredients, but the ba same basic overall thing. And so we said to ourselves, the corn is not integral to this particular ingredient in the sense that you don't buy a bag of Cheetos because it's made from corn. You, you buy it because you want that crunchy, salty, cheesy flavor. The corn is a delivery mechanism to get that in your mouth. And we said, if we could change that delivery mechanism and create something that has you know, something with a lot more nutrient density, and in our case, it turns out peas and lentils are the, are the right answer, then you can create the same overall feel and experience 
And it's the same approach that like the Beyond Meat and Impossible are taking with the meat category, right? Use plants to create a meat-like experience. And that's what we're doing. We're saying use um, a, a more nutrient dense base like peas and lentils to create a junk food style experience. We still want to create what I call the Cheeto experience, which means it's got to be crunchy, salty, cheesy, very orange, all that kind of stuff. And then while, while we were in the process of saying, okay, we got to have the base be more nutrient dense, we, was, we said to ourselves, look, we got to clean up the seasoning too, because moms today are not going to put up with the you know yellow number five and the red 40 and all that kind of stuff. So we said, okay, well, we can use turmeric or we can use natural elements to create the same vivid colors, the same, you know, incredibly strong flavors, no MSG. We can use yeast extracts instead. And we just did a bunch of stuff like that and ended up basically creating what we call, you know, a, a, a more nutrient dense natural version of a Cheeto. <laughs> yeah. I love it. And, I love it. So, 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 so how, so you guys came up with an idea, like a, a beta version of pitos. Um, how did you go to market with it? Did you call up Walmart and say, Hey guys, we've got this real, this new product we're working on, or did you go into specialty to start out? How did you, uh, how did you do that? No, I, I told you my, my, my philosophy in life earlier, right? Go elephant hunting. So yeah. we did exactly what you just said, by the way, we, we, we created, when we first finished it, we, we came to a point where we were like, hey, this is, we're happy with this. This is pretty damn good. And we, we said, okay, we created 20 sample kits and we said, we're going to send it to our 20 favorite, you know, 20 top buyers at these 20 retailers. And one of the big things that we did, which was really interesting was when we were selling the Sunkist items, we were selling them into the produce departments of all these retailers because Sunkist is a massive produce brand. So, right. and you've seen like nuts and those fruit kind of products in the produce section, right? So, so we knew the produce buyers and we were thinking to ourselves, look, we're never, you know, going into the salty snack aisle and try to compete with Frito-Lay. I mean, forget it, right? They have a DSC system. I think, in I, think I know where you're going. Keep going. Sorry. Yeah. So then, then we said, okay, well, most people would go then into the natural channel. They'd go into the, the big distributors, UNFI and Kehi. We have a variety of things that we don't like about both the, the natural channel and the natural distribution model. So we said, you know what? Let's think out of the box again. And we said, let's sell this in the produce section. Um, it turns out that that harvest snaps, which are those green pea snaps, I which are also, all over the har all over the produce section. Exactly, and, and those are peas, always being your sold. peas, right? Exactly, they're peas, and they're also like the, they're also extruded products. So there was already some precedent for that. So we sent it to all our produce buyer contacts, which we already knew at, at, at these retailers, and we we're like, we're gonna bring you, you know, we're gonna bring you this exciting way to disrupt, you know, Cheetos, right? And we thought, by the way, so I, we sent it out literally on like a Wednesday afternoon. It's going to take two days to arrive. So it arrives on Friday, right? I'm thinking, oh my God, by Monday morning, my phone's going to be lit up. Right? <laughs> I mean, people are going to be like, come up with a holy grail of snacks. I come in Monday and it's like crickets, right? So then two, a day goes by, two days goes by, a week goes by, three weeks goes by. And I'm like, by now I'm like a little depressed, to be honest. You know? yeah. I'm like, no, this you're... idea was not as big as I thought it was. Um, lo and behold, three and a half weeks into it, my, my head of sales runs into my office. And he's like, Nick, you're not going to believe what just happened. I'm like, what? He's like, I got a call from some broker who said that she was in the buyer uh, office of like the head produce buyer Kroger. And they said that they loved, got this snack and they absolutely love it. And they want to talk to the people who made it to us. And, and so we called them up and they're like, can you come meet with us? And they, the rest is history. But Kroger was our first customer and they literally launched Pitos in 2000 stores nationwide. Wow. Um, and so we went from no, like no customers to, to 2000 stores. It's overnight it's amazing so here's what i love for, uh, for like i feel like there's a lot of brands there's a couple strategies that happen with emerging brands even for us we've launched really into natural and specialty and um you know i would i would say our approaches have been a little bit smaller because we weren't we didn't have the manufacturing capability that we have now to go big on convenience do you think a lot of people in cpg think that the roadmap because the roadmap typically is going to natural regional then conventional then mass it sounds like you guys kind of flipped that, that, that strategy on its head. What do you think? You said elven hunting. What do you think about the, the state of food? Is that necessarily the only roadmap? Or do you think that, like, are you guys now pushing into specialty? How, how does that work? First of all, like my, my big, 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 huge belief in life is there's, there's never one roadmap. Yeah. yeah, people have to follow their own roadmap. And by the way, they're going to learn as they go. Just get going, as the old saying goes, you know? Totally, uh, totally. You'll figure it out. And by the way, there's more than one way to skin the cat. There's more than one path to get to the promised land, as we all know. So, so there's no one size fits all. However, for us, the reason this made a lot of sense was a few different things. Number one, we, we, we were in a position, which a lot of people are not in, where we had more capital because we already had an ongoing business here, right? We had a multi-million dollar business already. 
we were already doing business with massive customers like Pro, like Walmart, like Kroger. So we were, we, it wasn't like a startup in, in that sense. Even though part of it was a startup, we had a thriving business ongoing. Second, so we had access to more capital. You had, we had, you had, access, eight, you had an eight-figure business already. Right? Exactly. Versus like we a six-figure exactly. or a seven-figure. Exactly. Yes. We had access to manufacturing resources already, right? So, so because of the eight-figure business, we were able to get co-packers on board that could quickly scale up. And, and, and so th that, those are all different advantages that we had that, that changes the dialogue. The other thing is we were trying to disrupt and go after, you know, uh, like, you know, Frito-Lay and Cheetos, right? And salty snacks, a $20 billion category, right? And we knew that the consumer who eats those items is not necessarily the big natural channel shopper. So that was another thing is that, that was why when I said about the natural channel, like there's nothing against it, but the, 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 um, the, the, uh, for us, our, what, what our whole dream had always been is there's already a bunch of brands catering to what I call that. Let's just say I'm going to call it right now to simplify the top 10% echelon, right? Which is like the natural channel consumer. But the fact is, and you and I both know this, the natural channel consumer is a coastal consumer with a significant amount of, of, of annual household income and a pretty niche consumer. That is not America. America is not Definitely a natural not. channel Definitely consumer. Not. And so... And so people forget that sometimes, especially when we sit here and live on the coast and we're going to Natural Food Expo and we're like, oh my God, everyone's eating kale chips now, you know? And they're not. <laughs> kale chips in the United States is, is not even an $80 million business, all brands combined. You know, Funyuns in the United States is a $460 million business. How about, the fact, how about the fact that you look at a lot of these brands that are pricing at like twelve ninety nine per unit and it exactly. works coastally in specialty retailers, but like, are you building a lifestyle brand that's going to be a one to three million dollar business or exactly. are you trying to create a product for america i mean my goal our goal too is to create a product for every american household so i think there's exactly. that bifurcation in business models and you're right like we get caught up in these bubbles of not remembering like how big the country is and what exactly. the real opportunity so, is. and our goal was always to go after what i call the kroger and the walmart consumer the big mainstream broad consumer the ones that are eating the frito-lay products and what i call nine that other 90 percent and that was why we wanted to go with a, a broad approach. We, we wanted to avoid the distributor model because it adds a layer of cost, in all honesty, that has to get passed along to the consumer, which also makes it difficult to succeed. So that yeah. was another element of it. So of direct, what, what, direct with all those customers. Direct with all the customers. That's a key element of it. Um, and it's the only way we've gone. Um, but, you know, and because and, and, again, again, think of who we're competing with. We're competing with a guy who literally has their own driver delivering the stuff to the to these stores. You know, <laughs> right? Of course, of course, it's wild. <laughs> um, okay, so you got you, you launch into Kroger, you launch into Walmart as well, or we, we no, we launched into Kroger. That was our first customer. Then after Kroger, we launched into Safeway. Then after Safeway, we launched into Ahold. Then we got like a bunch of food service customers. Um, we launch into, I won't name, I can't name them for confidential no. will reasons. You, we, will you explain? So like when you launch into big customers like that, was it just moving? Like it was, the product was, the velocities were there. Is that just, a, uh, it just speaks to the product yourself or did you have to merchandise it and support the stores? Uh, if, no, first of all, that was one of our big learnings, by the way, along the way, if you ask me what challenges we had, you, you can't just throw it on the shelf and expect it to turn. Now, by the way, in our case, it turned probably a lot better than it should have because one of the advantages we had, again, was the familiarity of what we were creating in the sense that it was easy for a consumer to kind of make that jump in their minds of, oh, this is a, a, a healthier version of a Cheeto, right? Yep. And, and our entire business model is baked in that concept of make it super simple for the consumer to make that leap, which is why we didn't go the original route of the Indian snacks, right? We went this route of just making it super, super simple for the consumer to understand and basically going after the person who controls the market today and offering a better alternative. And that, and that approach I think has helped us because consumers naturally understand the product a lot better. What about price point? Were you pricing comp, were you comping their pricing or cheaper? No, no, we, 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 we cannot comp their price. We're always going to be more expensive because okay. it, it's a premium. Think of it this way. If you want junk food, but you don't want the junk, you don't want the, you know, you don't want the artificial stuff. And you don't want the corn, you're going to have to pay up for it. You can't, there's no getting around that. Right. Um, you can't have, it's like, it's like saying I want to, you know, drive a, a Mercedes, but I want to buy it for the price of a Hyundai. You're not going to get to do that. You know? Yep. Makes complete so, sense. So, so that said though, there are strategies you have to keep in mind in terms of channel approaches, pack size approaches. And I, I won't get into all of that detail right now, but you yeah. have to be very, very smart about how you approach those things so that it doesn't appear to be 
you know, like a, like a difficult point of entry, you know, and there's ways to make the point of entry, you know, more attractive to the consumer at, in, in the right places, by the way, because certain, certain channels are more price sensitive than others, et cetera, et cetera. And so did you just go really aggressive? Initially, you didn't put as much merchandising support. Did you just have a really strong field team to make sure that shelves look good, no out of stocks, you had good placement? Is that what you'd recommend for people going into convenience? Or how did you look at it? Data? We, we had none of that. We had none of that. We just <laughs> launched. <laughs> we launched in 2000 stores. And we were like, Damn. we thought, oh, my God, this is it. We've we, we hit yeah. the holy grail. We're going to be big overnight. And of course, that didn't happen either. So then we started counting challenges. We learned about, you know, we learned about the things that I'm sure, David, you learned and all entrepreneurs have learned the, the hard way. Uh, but uh, like simple things like, oh, well, when, 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 when Mr. Retailer says that they're going to be in 2,000 stores nationwide on X date, that that date, if you go into You're half in of those 300. Stores, <laughs> yeah, you won't even be there. You know, you learn about how, you know, when they say you're going to have these six, you know, 12 slots, you walk into the store and you have six slots, half of them don't even have the price tag on it. Yeah. And the other half, someone's pushed out of the way or, 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 you know, dumped upside down, you know, like you learn about all those things. Right. And you're like, Oh my God, like, what is this? How do yeah. I even deal with this? You know, I, I don't have people to go service 2000 stores. So then you work with your broker and you, and then, you know, you do all the heavy tackling and, and, and learnings that, that people have had to do. You, you, you have to dial up the marketing and, and it's a very, CPG is a very, what I call carefully orchestrated dance between, and you know this, between what I call the push and the pull. The push is get the product in the right places so that people can see them, interact with them, and they're easy to find. The pull is, of course, ideally have the consumer mindset being, I need to get this item before they even walk into that store. So if you if can you're hit- you're creating a destination marketing experience for your customer- while you're working on the push, that's where you're, you're going to start scaling and winning. Exactly. Exactly. And, and tying those two together in a carefully orchestrated dance, because remember, if you have one or the other, but the two are not linked, synced together well, I mean, you can have all the pull marketing you want. If your product isn't easy to find, no one's going to still buy it. It will be Done. completely ineffective. Yep. You know, so that's, that's, that's the million. And then those are all the things we learned over the last couple of years the hard way. And we're still learning, honestly, like we're not even like I, I wake up every morning thinking, oh, my God, like there's so like I, I wake up every morning thinking about how like almost literally feeling dumber than I did the day before sometimes, you know, like of how much how little did I know about all this and what like I'm, I'm 10 years into this now and I'm like, what was I thinking when I first started? Like, I thought I knew everything. I thought I was like the, the cat's meow 10 years ago. Now I'm like, I wake up and I'm like, I know nothing. <laughs> so here's my question to you, because it's ama like it's amazing for. For someone like yourself, like you had a JD, JD MBA, correct? You yeah. were a lawyer, you were in entertainment, you were in a managing director in an investment bank. And then you took some, you know, went into something so high risk, you know, really like financially taxing, emotionally taxing. What yeah. advice would you have? I mean, I'm going through it every day. Like you, I wake up every single day and there's a million things I can never get my to-do list done. But like, weirdly, I, st I absolutely love what I do. I'm obsessed. I'm almost addicted to it. But what advice would you have for like going through that really dark period when you were trying to persevere and, uh, and really push through it? People are, you have know, naysayers, critics, noise. Like what did you do that really uh, allowed you to, to push through? I mean, honestly, I think has, it's how you're wired, right? I mean, it, it does, I mean, I'm married, you, 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 you may be too. Like, like even my wife is so different than, than I am, right? Like, like so it, it, it's it, my brother, you know, I have a brother, I have a sister. I mean, everyone, you know, it's all, it's, it's, I think that you have to follow your heart and you have to follow how you're built and remember that, right? Like I always say, at the end of the day, people ask me and I'm like, the, the, everything they tell me, I'm like, you know what? Empirically, you're right in the sense that like, if they say, Nick, there's no way you're going, I mean, what are you thinking? You, you, are you crazy? You, are, you have no money. You, you, you barely know anything about the food business and you're going up against literally the guy that, that even Budweiser couldn't beat, you know, uh, free delay, right? Like, have you lost it? And I'm like, you know what, the chances of me making it are lower than the chances of me hitting zero, zero on roulette in, in, in like in, in Las Vegas. You know, I know that in my heart, but I also know, David, that I have spent my entire career, my entire life, in fact, doing these crazy things that somehow defied all odds and still managed to happen, you know, like, and I just know that about myself. And I don't know what it is. I can't even explain it, to be honest with you. Uh, I think it's a combination of just tenacity and, 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 you know, I don't know. Like, I, I, I figure it out, you know, and, 100, and it's like 100% survival rate. I actually don't think the most successful people are ever the smartest. I think it's that they literally just get back on the horse, like literally just don't stop. If you do not stop, you yeah. will continue to you, like if you never give up, you will be successful eventually. Right. Exactly. 
And all my uh, crew people have told me that, Nick, you just, like, even the people who invested in me early on, they were like, you know what, the idea is okay, but, you know, I, I, if you're behind it, I'm, I'm putting money in. You know, like, that's what they yeah. said. Because yeah. they knew that, like, once I sink my teeth into it, like, I won't let go of this bone until I get what I want, you know? John Paul DeJoria has this amazing saying where he was, he was a door-to-door -door salesman, and he's like, the reason I am as successful as I am is I literally will not stop going to the next door. So yeah. eventually, if you go to every door and you maximize every opportunity, you're going to, for network effect, like with network effects, you'll eventually push through. Um, dude, I love it. I think another thing to note is just everyone thinks these things happen overnight. You're 10 years in. And now, yeah. like, look, incredible fundraising, growth, brand, product. I absolutely love how aggressive you guys are. I don't know if you like, you don't have to talk about the lawsuit and everything, but I think it's incredible. I don't think enough people are talking about it. So I don't know if you want to go into it or if you're not supposed to talk about it. You, you tell me. We don't have to go too into it. But No, we can talk about it. So the, initially, the, the lawsuit itself like, got a little bit blown out of proportion in the sense that what happened is we, in our early packaging, we had basically uh, put like a little tiger emblem on our pack. And again, yep. you know, we believe in having fun with it like as we go. Because the other thing I learned about entrepreneurship is if you're not having fun with it, like you got to take a whole thing with a little bit of sense of humor. You got to think of like, oh, what I always wake up every morning, like in, beginning, in the beginning, it wasn't like this, but I taught myself over time. And nowadays, like I think also having kids and, and like it puts things in perspective. And I'm like, I wake up and I'm like, what is the worst thing that can happen on the business front? And I'm like, people will lose some money. That's really the worst thing. People will lose some money. No, one's, lose some money. no one's gonna die. No like, one's gonna what? get hurt. No one's gonna die. No one's gonna, you know, get, get, get terminally ill. Like, like the people I love the most are all safe and happy. And by the way, most of my investors, granted, no one wants to lose money. But if they lost the amount of money they put in my business, they're still going to go on and, and be very successful. And, and they'll invest in your next one if, if that even were to ever happen. Would be my they they, they, they probably another. will. Many of them probably will. So, right. so, so I'm like, you have to take things with a grain of salt and have a little bit of fun along the way. And so we were like, you know what? you know, we're going up against this massive gorilla. The only way we're going to beat them is through gorilla warfare. And so we're like, they have a cheetah. We're going to have a freaking tiger on the pack, you know, you that's a bigger cat, you know? So we put a tiger on the pack. One of our young marketing guys runs into my office one morning and he's like, Nick, did you know the tiger's average lifespan is, is longer than the cheetahs? It's like 17 years in the wild and the cheetahs is only 12. So we create this tagline, tigers live longer than cheetahs. Right? So good, so good. <laughs> and we stick it on the pack. Anyway, it, went, it didn't end there. Then we said, okay, we, we need to trademark this line. It's a great line. You know, everyone so loves good. it. So we go to the USPTO and try to trademark it. That is when Frito-Lay stepped in. That's when they said, you know what? Um, we don't want you to trademark it. You know, we don't yeah. like this. So, so we, that was really, it wasn't a lawsuit per se. It was more like a little bit of tussle on that back and forth. In the end, we both came to an amicable resolution. And, um, and they said they were not going to go after the Pito's brand name, which was more important for us. And, and we worked it out and no money changed hands. And I, won't, I can't get into anything more than that, but yep. It, yep. It, it's all fine. And they, they were fine and they were reasonable. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that, the legal side of it doesn't really keep me up at night. What keeps me up at night, of course, is a business battle. I mean, these guys are, you know, they're, they're owned by PepsiCo. They're one of the biggest advertisers in the country, right? And we've had situations where people are scared of that. I mean, they're spending a lot of money. You go to radio stations, you go to television stations, you go to even celebrities, a lot of celebrities, you know, these guys have spent a lot of money out there and, and, and we're taking a very openly, you know, controversial position against them. Right. And that's a little scary. And, it's, and some people are going to sign on with that, even with investors. Some some investors get skittish about that. Um, some people are going to sign on and love it. And some people don't, but I've always said in this world, if, if you're making everyone happy, you're probably not going to get very far. You're probably going to do some average things. Agreed. So you probably will have to, you know, piss some people off along the way in order to do something really exciting. No question. So in that, in that light, you know, if so if you, when, when people ask you about going into this business, you know, what advice would you have for other people who are trying to build a disruptive emerging brand um, just based on your, your experience over the last 10 years? Well, I think that, I think, it, you, you know, start with your, uh, make sure that you have a, a really strong, first of all, you know, make sure you have a really strong vision and, 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 and you have the passion and you feel like you have the stamina to go the distance. Number two, make sure that you have a, what I call an economically viable business model. That was one of the things we, we spent a couple, you know, about a year and a half figuring out early on is just that the unit economics can work, that you can scale up to build this to scale. Like, the, like you could have this amazing idea, right? That you could be like, oh my God, I make the world's best pancakes but I need this specific wrist movement that only I have to make this pancake this particular way. 
And, and that's not going to get very far as a business because you're going to be very limited about how many of those you can make. You know? yep, so, yep. so no, no, any good idea, you have to pressure test it for economic viability. If, if you, by the way, you, and, and, and that's the other thing. Remember that always remember what is your underlying objectives because there are people in this world who their entire objective is, Hey, if I sell a few of these to my neighbors and, and do it as a side gig, I'm happy. It makes me happy. Look, then do it, you know, all by all means. But if, if you were looking to build a, a, a large business, which, which can be investor driven, because if once you get investors, you have a fiduciary responsibility to make them money, you know, and yep. don't, don't forget that. So if you want to keep it small, I suggest just bootstrap it and keep it to yourself. You know, that, uh, that way you won't have a lot of stress. Once you get investors involved, remember that you, ha- it, it, it changes the equation. And now you better be focused on building a true business, you know, and, and so, um, so once you, once you pressure test that, you know, and, and battle test that, then I would say you just start doing. You start doing it one t- step at a time. You don't have to get the product perfect. We're on the fourth iteration of the product, just like Beyond Meat is on there, you know, several, you know, I don't know, fifth or sixth iteration, impossible, same thing, right? Everyone is constantly in, you know, you know, Apple launches a new, you know, 10th phone that they're on. So, so just get, get, you know, create a product that's, that's good, get it in the market and just get going, you know, and, um, and take advice, uh, be smart about who you surround yourself with. We were super fortunate to have the most amazing investors from literally from early on. Carlos was just one of the guys I mentioned, but we had a Pooh Modi. He was a former president of Mars Food. He's on our board today. We have Carl Lee. Carl was a former CEO of Snyder Lance. We have like, uh, Dean Hollis, who was a former CEO of ConAgra, and he's currently chairman of Spain Celestial and Sun, Sun Opta. Uh, dream I mean, the, team right there. It's like it, you it, mentioned, it, yeah. It, those, those insights alone from those four companies, those people. Yeah. I mean, incredible. I love that. Exactly. Uh, what, so what, uh, Nick, and we, we, I know I want to be cognizant of your time. What, okay. What's the broader mission for, you know, for Snack It Forward? Like what, you know, initially you had this vision. What is it today? Where, where is the company headed? And, and you know, what, what do you hope to really accomplish with, with the Snack It Forward brand? Um. The vision of the, of the company is, is essentially to disrupt the $20 billion market for, you know, this certain style of, of salty snacking that, again, is dominated by one company in, in the United States, you know, Frito-Lay, right? And they had this, this aisle, call it, in the store, which, which they pretty much dominate, right? And I call it the Frito-Lay aisle. You, some people call it the snack aisle. I call it the Frito-Lay aisle because it is pretty much controlled by them. It's all their brands, Right. And my dream is that one day there's going to be half of that aisle dedicated to pea-based snacks, you know, that will be analogous to some of America's favorite snacks today. And by doing so, we will be able to serve up, uh, you know, allow, like, think of it this way. If every Cheeto in the United States is replaced with pedos, kids would be eating twice the protein, three times the fiber. They would be consuming nothing artificial, n- no added MSG. It would be non-GMO, it's gluten-free. So this literally has all the characteristics of what I call a better-for-you snack, right? But the, the, what sets it apart from a lot of better-for-you snacks is that it, it tastes, acts, walks, and talks like the, their, their junk food counterpart. And my, Doesn't my vision sacrifice is... On qual- never sacrificed on quality. Never sacrificed on Never sacrificed on taste or quality. And my vision is basically to establish a strong, dominant company that can be a real, true number two to Frito-Lay. You know, number one, I don't know. I'll, I'll be happy being a strong number two. You know, yeah, um, yep. and, and and owning a certain piece of that of that real estate. Uh, and I think the time has come. I honestly do. I think that there's a lot of dynamics at play. That that the consumers want this. Retailers want this. Channel partners. Everyone we talk to, they're like they're hungry for something like this. And I think the time has come. So we have a long road ahead. We have a big battle ahead. Um, but uh, we're excited about it. Well, Nick, I'm, I'm inspired, man. I, uh, I absolutely love it. The amount of wisdom that was shared in this chat, unbelievable. Thank you for being so open. Um, everyone, this is episode 15 with Nick Desai from Snack It Forward. Um, dude, congrats on everything. And, you know, we'll be 100% uh, you know, supporting pedos whenever I see them. So. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you at one of the, the events once we can get back to some face-to-face interaction. But uh, I really appreciate the time. And um, I got to tell you, like, I'm a big fan of, of the Dream Pops products. I'm a big fan of what you're doing. I'm a big fan of so many of the entrepreneurs out there that have that I've had uh, the pleasure of interacting with. And I get inspired by that also. Um, and it's, it, 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 it's good to know that you're not alone, right? That, that we're all out there supporting each other. And, and we all have our own, you know, we all sometimes have those dark moments. 
But um, I, I and I would really appreciate that you're taking the time, even though you're trying to run this company, to actually you know uh, share the, the the vision and story of entrepreneurs like myself. That alone is 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 really uh, uh, admirable, and and uh, I appreciate the time, David. Of course, I mean the more and more we do this, there's just so many overlapping trends and values and missions that just the ability to share them um, and bring them together, it's, it's been powerful. So Nick, Thank you. keep crushing it. Have a great weekend and uh, we'll talk soon, man. Awesome. Thanks, David. Bye. Cheers.